Happy sunshine, boys and girls. Welcome back. August 25th, 1.54 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, I've got a couple updates. Uh, we got some housekeeping things to do for our Hat J series of videos. First of all, uh, Captain Spaulding has a court calendar that he sent me. Apparently, this is all that's going on in court today. Well, hello, sweetheart. Did you come to say hello to the everyone out there? Okay, well, say hello one more time. All right, okay. All right, you lay down right there, sweetheart. I love you, too. All right, that's my kitty cat. Um... So, I double-checked the IUV website. Look at this. Uh, there's some additional information that wasn't there before. Uh, as you recall, yesterday when I did my video, this is the way the IUV website looked. It just says, have a jurisdiction hearing 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. It didn't say which day it was, so I was just assuming that it was this morning. And, you know, when, whenever you make assumptions, you're you're standing on shaky ground and uh, we've got different information now so she's got a few days uh, to get ready for the jurisdiction hearing there's some interesting comments coming in about jurisdiction uh, check out these comments um, the comment that I really want to focus on here let's see where is it this is it right here from Jody Russell this is interesting when we go to the link this is rule 9 of the federal rules of criminal procedure this is about arrest warrants or summons let's make this page a little bigger so that you guys can see it all right if we look down here, this is Rule 9, uh, B1. This is specifically about the form of the warrant. So we got Rule 9, which is about arrest warrants, summons on an indictment or information, which is the case in uh, Randy and Heather's uh, legal battles here. So Section B is about the form or the, the paper that the warrant is on, you know, the actual document. And then subsection one, this is really, really interesting. Jody, this is a great find. The warrant must conform to rule four, subsection B, subsection one, except that it must be signed by the clerk and must describe the offense charged in the indictment or information. Wow, this is great, great work here. Um, the more I get into this, the more I realize what a different beast federal court is. I mean, I've testified in federal court, and I knew that it was a different quote-unquote jurisdiction, but I never realized just how many tiny little things are are different uh, so here we've got a code section uh, that is the support for how a clerk can sign a warrant and that's pretty interesting so deputy clerk a brush u.s magistrates crossed out my question is up here revision january of 09 so this is this is a boilerplate form, guys, and it's got U.S. Magistrate Judge filled in. Um, there is no judge listed on this paper anywhere. I don't, I don't see that. Do you see a judge's name anywhere on this paper, guys? Other than these initials, T-A-V, which is Thomas A. Varlin. I don't see any mention to a judge on here and and that's just my my brain's having a hard time <laughs> my brain's having a hard time figuring out how it is that our system 
in one place says that a warrant's valid only when it's signed by a judge or magistrate. And then in another area, it says that the warrant must conform to Rule 4B1, except that it must means there's no other way, okay? Must be signed by the clerk. Doesn't say signed by anybody else. This is so strange, guys. I mean, if the clerk has, if they've got a boilerplate form and if this is such a, a common occurrence, then how come there isn't a checkbox? Oh, no, this was the deputy clerk that signed it. Rather than having a cross out U.S. magistrate judge. I, I don't know what's going on here, but... Here's how you operate from a place of knowing without knowing what's going on. You can say, well, here's a code section apparently from the Cornell Law School that, uh, that a warrant must be signed by the clerk in the case of an, a warrant coming from an indictment. Uh, <laughs> wow. It doesn't say must be signed by a judge. It says must be signed by a clerk. Why, why does their boilerplate form have judge filled in? I'm, I'm confused about this, guys. I really am. What's going on here? So let's, let's take a look at Rule 4B1. So here we are. This is uh, dealing with complaint, warrant, or summons by telephone or other reliable electronic means. If a magistrate or judge, or if a magistrate judge decides to proceed under this rule, the following procedures apply. So they, they can consider information communicated by telephone or other reliable electronic means when reviewing a complaint or deciding whether to issue a warrant or summons. Huh. Let me read that again. A magistrate judge may consider information communicated by telephone or other reliable electronic means when reviewing a complaint or deciding whether to issue a warrant or summons. Procedures. If a magistrate decides to proceed under this rule to hear information and to consider information communicated by telephone or electronic means, then the following procedures apply. He has to take testimony under oath. The judge must place under oath and may examine the applicant and any person on whose testimony the application is based. And what, what this means, and may examine, this is just, uh, it's not the judge is going to take in information and, and just not look at it. Uh, but examine means, it's kind of like, you know, when they tell a lawyer, you may begin your examination or cross-examination. So the judge, the judge can ask questions and expect answers and use those answers uh, during, during this process. And apparently, after this process, Rule 9 says that a warrant must be signed by the clerk. And, and if that's such a common thing to be codified in law, then why, why does their boilerplate have, have this down here already pre-filled in? Um, Anyways, thank you so much, Jody. This is this is absolutely pertinent to the case, and how can there? Here's a potent question for you guys: How can you, as citizens or people, I don't want to use that word. Gosh, there's so many words I don't want to use anymore. How can you, as beings, uh, We'll call it lay people, uh, anyone without experience dealing with the uh, <laughs> dealing with the system here. 
how can any of you expect to understand and navigate your way through this when somebody who's had extensive experience with the system is having trouble uh, finding all the ins and outs and the, and the little loopholes and, you know, the rule 9B1s where it says that the clerk must sign the warrant. Wow, I, I feel like I feel like I'm in a twilight zone, guys. So keep your emails coming, keep the comments coming. It really feels like we've got a high vibrational discussion going. And with any luck, some high vibrations and positive focus on the outcome is going to break this whole matter wide open in a way even more magical than any of us can imagine right now. If you got any love lighter links for me, send them to lunacy, L-U-N-A-S-E-E -E, at protonmail.com. And, and just while I'm, while I'm here, this uh, Judge David Wynn Miller guy, somebody posted a link down here. This one right here, AZ90 Madma. Uh, if you're into gematria, there's some, there's some interesting things going on. He's claimed to have decoded the mathematical relationship of language, just language period. And uncovering that, he found a commonality and has been able to write sentences uh, forwards and backwards in any language uh, to have any meaning and it's all in the math and and it's a nine hour video so I'm certainly not all the way through that I don't know if I'll get through that anytime soon got a lot of other things on my to-do list that have a higher priority uh, but wow Judge David Wynn Miller, I, I can't verify or I don't have a feeling on veracity, but I listened to the first five minutes of the link that's down here in the comments and wow, I might have to set aside a day just to, just to watch some more of that uh, really, really potent stuff. Um, so if, if you're into Gematria and you watch that and it seems bona fide, forward that on to Derek at Gematronator64 or Zach Hubbard. This is some interesting stuff. He also claims to be a 92nd, 9-2, 92nd degree Mason. And uh, uh, he has some words to say about that. So, you know, uh, there's some information coming in today that's, really challenging some major perceptions that I've been carrying around in my head. And those perceptions have been affecting the way I make decisions and affecting my perception of reality and affecting my behavior that, that I display into that perception of reality. And so thank you all for this light. This is how we figure it out. And this is how we reclaim our power and do it ourselves. All right. Peace out, guys. I love you a lot. And uh, now we have a little bit more time every day to focus on the 29th for a positive outcome for Heather. All right. Bye-bye.